Um, so I'm Chiara uh, from King's College, and I am the network, one of the network organizers of the Network E, so Political Economy of Industrial Relations and Welfare, uh, and I'll be chairing um, this session on um, the book edited by Emanuele uh, uh, Pavolini from the University of Macerata, uh, Marino Regini, University of Milan, and uh, Luigi Burroni, University of Firenze. And uh, the, the session will uh, start with uh, Luigi introducing the book, and then we'll have, uh, we should have had three critics, but I guess we have all uh today. Um, so uh, the, the, uh, we have Philip Ratkeb here. Um, he's, uh, Philip is a lecturer in uh, social policy at the University of Edinburgh. He was previously as a postdoctoral researcher in Constance, and he has published in top political economy and, um, and industrial relations journals. And he also has uh, published a book with Cornell University Press that actually, actually presented also in this network at the SASE conference in New York, if you were there, and, um, and, uh, and also has currently a book under contract with OUP. Uh, then we have uh, Paul Marquez, in, uh, he's assistant professor at the Department of Political Economy at Dichte. If you were at the CS a week ago, uh, this is where Paolo works and has his office. Um, uh, he, um, he published also in, a, in top political economy journals like Socioeconomic Review, Comparative European Politics, and also in industrial relations journals. And uh, he's currently the PI of a big project on labor market uh, dualization, which is called uh, Solid Jobs, together with Rui and, and Luis there. All right, so I think, um, so the introduction of the book first, then uh, we'll uh, let the discussant uh, give their comments. We'll give the chance uh, uh, to the author to respond very briefly, and then we'll open uh, the floor to your comments and, and questions. Okay, Luigi, uh, I think I'm, I'm done. Uh, so you can go, and if you don't, don't hear us or don't hear the questions, I will repeat them in the mic here. Yeah. Okay, thank you. No, no, the, um, now I'm able to hear you very quite well. Yeah. So thank you, Chiara. Thank you very much for this possibility to discuss the volume in this research network. And also thank you very much to the two discussants, Philip and Paul, for their for their participation and very kind and passionate role of the discussions. Um, fortunately, I was supposed to be at the conference, but it was not possible because yesterday my flight, yesterday evening my flight was cancelled, so I have to do this at distance. But anyway, we are very happy, me, Marino and Manuele, we are very happy to discuss with you this book. That is a very um, collective work. Um, it is a book that uh, is on a work that started in 2015, and it includes a high number of authors. It is basically, um, the book is split in two parts. It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, there is a first part that is on, on the, the, I mean, the, the, the entire volume is on the Mediterranean capitalism, and especially the, the two main aims of the book were to understand why Mediterranean capitalism experienced so very strong difficulties to recover from the 2008 crisis. This is the first general aim. And the second aim is to understand if this concept of Mediterranean model uh, still has sense, still makes sense, because if, or if there are so many differences inside, or, or if there is a process of diversification inside this model that um, in, in a certain sense, reduce the importance of this sort of idea type. So we decided to face with these issues, and especially with the, the, the difficulties of these countries to recover from the crisis, looking at two, basically, at two main dimensions. The first one was the more general contextual dimensions in which we focused the attention on the, 
on the literature of varieties of capitalism that, as you know, define this model as a mixed model between the liberal market economies and coordinated market economies. And we focus in especially on more recent evolution and changes of the literature. So the first part of the book, in the first part of the book, we, we had some, we have four chapters. The first one is a chapter wrote by Lucio Baccaro that is on the more recent literature on growth models and how it integrates the functioning and the regulation of the demand side of the economy into theory, theories primarily oriented in, in to, 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 to the supply side. Then there is a, a chapter by Giliberto Capano and Andrea Lippi that, the, that analyzes the, the new role of the state in the economies and especially how uh, the particular institutional capacity and public capacity of the state in these four countries has. <laughs> because the, the, the book define Mediterranean capitalism looking mainly at four countries that are Spain, Italy, Greece, and Portugal. And all the chapters focuses on these four countries. And in this case, the, the chapter of uh, Lippi and Capano focuses on the public um, capacity of the state to make efficient and if, um, efficient and well-targeted policies to, for development in the four countries. So it's a, it's a chapter on the role of the state and on the role of public administration and on the role of the efficiency of public administration. Then there is a chapter by Sofia Perez that is titled for which level of analysis internal versus external explanation of Eurozone di divergence. In this case, the analysis is on the interaction between Eurozone regulation and national and institutional settings and on how this interaction can explain the difficulties of, of these four countries. And finally, the, the last chapter of this uh, first part is by Emanuele Pavolini and Gemma Scalise that is on the role played by social cultural factors such as social values and the functioning of, uh, of uh, core social networks starting from the families in explaining economic growth and innovation. So in the first part of the book, this is, there is this more broad approach to our problem that is, as I said before, why the Southern European countries experience so many difficulties in recovering from the crisis. And the second part of the book is more on the role of public policies and on the role of endogenous variable. And especially there is a book that there are four chapters. Uh, the first one is on labor market regulation and their regulation and wage setting institutions in Mediterranean capitalism. This is written by Alexander Afonso, Lisa Dorigatti, Oscar Molina, and Ariana Tassinari. And in this case, we look at the interplay between industrial relations institutions, the role of the state, and, 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 and other mechanism of labor regulation in explaining this, the, the specific kind of regulation of employment and of wage setting in the four countries. Then there is another chapter uh, by Andy Lien, Matteo Iostula, Manos Mazzaganis, Rui Branco, and Emanuele Pavolini on the role of the welfare state, on the welfare system in the, in the four countries. A chapter, another chapter by Fabio Bulfone and Manuela Moschella on the role of bank, the banking system and financial system in the four countries. And finally, um, a, a chapter by me, by Marino Regini and Sabrina Colombo on the role of human uh, capital and on the role of uh, and on the role of innovation policies uh, in explaining the difficulties of this of the uh, of these countries. What what emerged looking at these two to 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 let's say institutional arena, uh, external and internal exogenous and, and endogenous is that there is a specific institutional settings that is quite common, not really the same, but quite common in the four countries that hinder um, the economic growth, favoring the emerging of a, what we have called a, a medium, um, 
a, a medium way to grow goods uh, that is distinct, that is very different from the high road for development of central and northern European countries based on innovation and high quality production and based on on, on high quality, a part of high quality employment and also different from, for example, Central and Eastern European countries that are experiencing the low road to recover. This middle, this middle way is, according to us, a sort of a trap that hinders the competitiveness of these countries because we do not have the advantage of the high road and neither the advantage in terms of cost of the, of the low road. And here there is the second aim of the book that is trying to explain if the, in the, the, the concept of uh, Mediterranean model still makes sense. And in this part we emphasize that also the previous literature emphasized that there are many differences inside this model, but what, what seemed what, what emerged from some chapters is that there is a process of diversification inside this model, especially for some of the, of the variables that we look into account, and especially from the social cultural point of view, and also from, for example, policies for innovation and policies for education. That is, this process of diversification is showing that there is a sort of two clusters inside the, the, the Mediterranean model. On the one hand, Italy and Greece, and on the other, Portugal and Spain. And there is this process of process of progressive diversification that has started since the beginning of the crisis. <clears throat> um, finally, a third a third objective of the book is why. Um, in the four countries, and especially in two of them, that are Greece and Italy, um, national governments, because the, the, the perspective adopted by the model is basically a perspective uh, of, uh, of analysis of national policies, even if all the four countries are characterized by evident regional disparities, but our focus is mainly on national policies. And uh, the, the third objective, the third aim that I mentioned before, is trying to make some hypothesis on why these four countries made, let's say, wrong policies for such a long period of time. For example, if you look at innovation, try to explain why in the four countries we decided to not invest strongly in research and development in countries in which there was a structure basically um, mainly based on small to medium enterprises that require, had a strong need of a public intervention in supporting economic growth through, um, through the support to research and development. So what we try to explain was why, despite these needs that were very important in order to favor a process of upgrading of Mediterranean capitalism, why, despite these needs, these states continue, these governments continue to do, let's say, wrong policies. And in this case, we, we distinguish it between uh, supply side um, effects so that were basically um, based on the role of, uh, of, uh, of a low level of institutional capacity of, uh, of government that were not able to identify exactly which were the needs that the public, that, 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 that the uh, economic structure had, um, but also on, on the demand side, because um, this kind of policies produce a lot of problems, but at the same time produce quite a strong consensus. For example, policies to support um, the, the building sectors, the, the construction sector in Spain, were among the policies that hindered the rise of innovation in other sectors, and, and these strong investments in this kind of sector favor certain conditions that um, during the 2008 crisis um, created a lot of problems, this, kind of this kind of sectoral specialization, but at the same time, even if it, it, it was a problematic choice in terms of industrial policies, in terms of uh, development policies, these policies created a lot of consensus in, in, in Spain before, obviously, 
of the 2008 crisis. Or, for example, the strong process of flexibilization uh, that especially Portugal and Spain experienced since mid-80s mid uh, was, on the one hand, responsible for the sort of um, development through low level, low quality employment, but at the same time it produced a consensus increasing the level of employment, especially for youth, and in some cases also especially for Portugal for women. So uh, let's say it, it, these double coins, this double side of the coin uh, in terms of public policies helped us to understand why wrong policies were made, let's say wrong policies were made for such a long period of, of time. And this is, I will stop here if, if uh, Emanuele or Marino want to add something, but please let me finish by thanking all the people who participated in this venture. Doing an edited book is a very challenging, is a very challenging venture, and in some cases it can be a nightmare because it's a very complicated coordinate <laughs> the work of so many people, but in this case it was really it was really a pleasure and I mean we are the editor but the book is a really a very collective is a very collective book and we are very happy for the results but not really for our work but for the kind of interaction that we had and it was a, a real pleasure and we hope to have other experience with this author and also with other in a very few period of time. So we stop here and ready for uh, thank you. Thank you, Luigi. I think I think I think we'll stop here because you spoke 15 minutes, and maybe Marino and Emanuele can take the difficult questions after you uh, after yeah, the I, the critics agree, uh, gave gave their comments. And I had also forgotten that we have actually one of the authors in the room, Rui, so he can also take the difficult questions for you in case you don't hear them. All right. So uh, then I would I would let Paolo Paolo present. I might even be able to share your presentation again, maybe. Uh, yes, I think I just did that. All right, OK. So if you want to come here so you can speak in the mic. OK, so I suppose I have about 10 minutes, so I will try to uh, respect the time limit. Um, First of all, thank you very much for inviting me to make these brief comments on, on the book. Um, it's a pleasure. Uh, I will touch upon two main points, uh, what I think are the main strengths, and I will focus more on further developments, things that perhaps, I don't know, but can be useful for uh, going even uh, um, deeper on this uh, topic. Um, uh, first of all, I think this book, um, it's, um, there is something which I don't have it here in the presentation, but I think it's important to mention, which is the fact that this is relevant not only for the academia, but also for policy making, for policy makers, for governments. So I think th because this addresses a very topical issue, it's not only a theoretical problem or something that we are interested for academic reasons, but it is something that is being discussed, uh, I don't know, but in Portugal this is a very topical issue, uh, how we can manage to find a better balance in terms of uh, having um, greater levels of economic growth, but at the same time sustainable in terms of the public finance. So this is relevant in that regard. I think that's very important. And making a bridge with the uh, the recent discussion on the book by uh, Pallier uh, and Assel, the, the, the idea of growth strategies and growth regimes. So I think this is important because to somehow there is a discussion on how to solve many of the problems that exist in Southern Europe. And I think this is relevant for them as well, not only for academics. So I think this addresses a, a relevant policy issue as well. Um, and I think um, it shows very well um, the fact that there are problems in, in Southern Europe in terms of trying to f find a better um, growth uh, model, if, if we want. Uh, there are different trajectories, and I think this is important. I think it makes sense to speak about the Mediterranean capitalism, but there are 
internal differences, as in all uh, models. It's a simplification, but I think it, it makes sense, and I think the book shows that very well. And it pinpoints different alternatives, and I think this is very important as well. Uh, somehow, um, it shows that there is the, the kind of strategy that exists in Central European countries, like uh, moving on to reduce wages, try to reduce uh, taxes, uh, attract foreign direct investment and try to follow that path or the alternative more based on um, high skilled human capital, innovation and high social cohesion, which is more realistic than try to follow like the German model with, with a lot of uh, difficulties on implementing this in, in, in peripheral economies. So I think it shows very well that there are two alternatives and um, both of them difficult to implement, but it, it's perhaps the more uh, realistic. Uh, there are differences, of course, between the chapters, this hypothesis of more high-skilled human capital, etc. It's not present in all, in all the chapters, uh, but uh, this is, I think, the two, if we can imagine, the two alternatives that uh, can be implemented. Um, and I think something which is very important is, is the last point that I have in the PowerPoint, which is politically it's very difficult to implement in Southern Europe the, the, the first um, uh, hypothetical uh, way to, to grow. And I think this is very important because we saw that during the uh, austerity period and the consequences in terms of the political system. Uh, and this is very clear that trying to implement that kind of model in southern European countries, it may lead to huge uh, transformations in the political system. We, see, we, we can see that in Greece, in Spain, uh, somehow in Portugal, but not at the same scale, uh, and in Italy for sure. So there are, uh, and we are speaking about political economy, so these political issues are very important. And I think this is, in my view, something which is very, very uh, relevant uh, as well, because even today there is a push very strong from unions and uh, from the citizens on trying to increase wages, and this is like at, at the top of, of the agenda, like in Portugal, uh, the increase of the minimum wage by 30% in six years, the push towards now the government wants to increase med uh, average wages by 20% in, uh, at the, uh, in four years, so this is quite difficult to to implement that kind of model, I think uh, also for political uh, reasons. Uh, what are, in my view, um, the main, uh, some, some things that I, I, I think are important for further developments of this uh, discussion? I think there is perhaps an excessive uh, emphasis on the fact that over the recent par, uh, past, southern European countries did not invest in education, skills, research and development, and the innovation policies. Uh, I think there are differences between uh, countries, but for instance, the, the Portuguese case, and also the Greek one, but the, I, I know better the Portuguese case, there was an, a, a, a huge investment in, 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 in these fields. Um, because Portugal was very much committed with all the Lisbon agenda in which the Portuguese government was very involved since the early 2000s. Um, the, the central left, which was the government that went ahead with, uh, it was the, during the Portuguese presidency of the European Union, they have been in power for 22 years, in 27, in the, in the last 27 years. So there was some kind of continuations of policies throughout this period. Uh, they were very committed in 2007 with the Flex Security Agenda and now in Porto with the uh, Social Cohesion Agenda. And so I think that perhaps it's excessive um, and we can see some data. And, and for instance, in the Portuguese case from 2005 to 2011, I think that's very clear. Then after the sovereign debt crisis, it was a very specific period with a lot of external uh, constraints. But if we look at some data like the chair of the population with tertiary education, um, for instance, uh, like coming from like the Portuguese case from 10% of young people with higher education degree to 42% uh, in 2021. It's impressive. I think it's impressive. We have 
uh, other cases that also show this pattern, but there is a, a, a substantial increase, like early leavers from education and training from 41% or 43% in the early 2000s on the launch of the Lisbon Agenda, and then like 8% uh, in 2021. There was a massive investment in, in education, of course, boosted by the structural funds as well, which was very much aligned with this kind of agenda. And even investment in research and development, especially from 2005 to 2011, there was a substantial increase in, in, in investing in this kind of, of policies. And more recently, in the Greek case as well, uh, uh, the of course, it's still far away from the uh, European Union average. There are differences um, compared with the Nordic countries, of course, but there were like some kind of political commitment on, on, on doing this. And from my, uh, and even the PISA results, like the quality of uh, training that young people have in uh, sec uh, secondary education, for instance, there, there was a massive drop on early living. Uh, 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 from education and a substantial increase, especially in mathematics and I think in science, in terms of the results in the PISA tests. Okay, they have the limitations, but they show something. Okay, in terms of there was a substantial increase. Portugal, for instance, increased a lot. Sorry, it's in Portuguese, it was a colleague. We had a presentation and I used the, the, the graph. Um, what I think uh, is the problem, um, the crucial problem from my perspective, is that despite these investments, the size of knowledge intensive sectors did not expand at the same pace. Okay? So we could say, okay, it's not enough, but we would expect that something could change in terms of uh, what are the key sectors of the economy. And for instance, th there is this, uh, is, this is taken from the chapter by uh, Lucio Baccaro, and we can see that after the, so uh, it did not increase, and for instance, in the Portuguese case, after the, the sovereign debt crisis, it even decreased the size of uh, sectors, uh, more advanced uh, sectors, and it is still very much based on low, uh, low technology sectors. Uh, and it is not only the sovereign debt crisis, but the sovereign debt crisis even led to that. There was a massive destruction of employment in high-skilled sectors as well during uh, this period because the state was very committed on expanding those companies, trying to create incentives, etc. And after the crisis, things changed a lot in that regard in terms of public policies, etc. So what I think is that there, is some, there are limits on the supply side policies of saying that if you invest in education, research and development, innovation policies, active labor market policies, this will lead to a transformation of the economy and will speed up the transition. And I think there are limits uh, for this, and we can see that in several countries, and I, I think the Portuguese case illustrates this quite well. Um, for, and there is something which is mentioned in the book, uh, but perhaps one minute, but perhaps needs more uh, uh, development, is the issue of industrial policies. Um, I'm not a specialist on, on the topic, but there are some colleagues at my department that uh, discuss this uh, a lot from development studies and, and so on and so forth. But I think this needs more elaboration uh, because um, Perhaps it's the peace that is missing, okay? Besides these supply side um, policies. Um, and there are strands of literature on this, mainly from uh, uh, other, uh, like the Global South, like development state literature, development studies literature. Perhaps it's, we need to connect these this, this debates. Uh, and this, um, this kind of agenda of modernizing the economy requires a strong state, perhaps, um, and I don't know if this is compatible with EU competition policies and the kind of more pro-liberalization in the economic field, in which it's very difficult for the state to, to help firms, to establish new firms, uh, large and medium firms, and perhaps this goes against that kind of uh, restrictions. And in my view, EU liberalization policies are more compatible with an agenda which is only focused on supply-side policies. And 
perhaps it's necessary to change that as well in order to uh, boost, boost this kind of uh, transition. And finally, just a very brief point. I think in some chapters there, there is still some kind of idea that in southern European countries insiders remain completely protected and outsiders are very vulnerable. And I think what we have uh, seen in the recent past is a deterioration of the labor market position of the two groups for many reasons like privatizations, career freezes in public administration, wage stagnation in the public administration, deregulation of permanent contract. So I think it's, uh, things have changed a lot in, in, in that regard and I think that's important to, to bring that to, to, to this discussion as well. I think it's, thank you. Thank you so much, Paolo, for, for the comments. I would go straight to Philip then, who doesn't have slides, but he is, is welcome to come here anyways. And then I will let the authors respond. So hello, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to um, contribute to this debate. So I'll be very old fashioned, just with handwritten notes. Um, I, I'm not a Southern Europeanist person. Should I look in this? No, you see me anyway, right? Yeah, you do. Okay, I'm not a Southern Europeanist per se. I will approach the issue more from a comparative perspective, even though I have little things to say about Italy, and I try to um, contextualize the Southern European case um, from the perspective of comparative political economy and reflect on the basic argument of this book. So I, I like this book for, for three reasons in particular. So the first one is how it approaches Southern European capitalism to begin with. So if you revisit the varieties of capitalism literature, there is a bit of an uneasy relationship to that region in the sense that you know it's not CME, it's not LME, it's, it's MME, but it's not really, I didn't find it a very appealing, um, interesting debate, that kind of categorizing efforts. And the book instead is very historical and concrete, and thereby it opens up the analytic space in order to identify diversity in a sense that there is a bit of a divide between Spain and um, Portugal on the one hand doing relatively better and um, Italy and Greece on the other hand by looking concretely at these institutions and how they underpin different um, trajectories of economic performance. So I, I, I like that. The second thing I like is the explanatory setup. So um, edit volumes, they are typically like loosely connected in a sense that I mean, the chapters speak to each other, but not necessarily so much. And in this case, it's very coherent volume. So there is two clear questions. How have they evolved over time? And um, what explains why, um, in comparative terms, their economies haven't fared so well? And what, to some extent, also explains the kind of intra-regime variation? And in this way, the book, it talks about three factors, or three explanations in particular. One is the supply side story. Um, that what is lacking is internal devaluation, hasn't gone too far. A bit of the straw man, but it's politically a very powerful explanation. That's why it's good that it's um, addressed in the book. Um, second, the Eurozone, in a sense that the Eurozone constraint um, is too pervasive for these countries to generate the necessary policy-making autonomy to carve out industrial policies and economic policies. And the final factor, and that's the most important factor in the book, is research and development. And thereby it points to policy and administrative capacity, and as such it's um, a, a good contribution. And the, the third thing I like about the book, it's, it's deeply political. Um, so um, Paolo already alluded to that in the sense that um, I, I, when I was reading it, I, I was mainly thinking about the viability of the Eurozone. I think it's, it's um, uh, not far-fetched to say that the viability of the Eurozone hinges to a large, ex large extent on the economic, um, economic fortunes of Italy. And so by reading this book, so you don't have to be a Southern Europeanist per se, but if you care about CPE, European political economy and European integration, um, that's certainly a, a, a must read. So um, these are the, the three things I liked in particular. So with regard to the argument, um, which is to say that the reason why these countries haven't done so well in economic terms is the lack of research and development and human capital formation. So my, my first question, let's assume uh, I buy the argument. I think it's, um, it's very plausible that this is something that is missing in these countries. But my question was how to get there. So if you 
come up with a, a solution, so to speak, the question is, um, is that politically viable? Do you have the political support coalitions? Do you have the um, administrative and state capacity to actually do that? And after reading this book, I was, on the one hand, I, I found it, the explanation appealing. At the same time, I, found, uh, I felt like um, this is not going to happen. <laughs> because, you, because the economic structure of, I mean, at least especially in Italy, with small, um, small sized uh, employers typically invested in, 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 in tourism, recreational services with low levels of innovation, low levels of human capital formation. And as such, the, the political coalition is, I, I couldn't really see how that may translate into a viable policy agenda based on, you could call it a, a dominant social bloc that would push for this, this kind of agenda. So in other words, I mean, I was reminded by, um, there is this, this interview by, by Mario Monti um, in 2011 in the German newspaper Die Welt. And the headline of, of the, the newspaper article is, why Italy should become more like Germany. And then Mario Monti goes on to say, yes, we have to become like Germany. They did the agenda 2010. In this way, you reinvigorated cost competitiveness. And I mean, as a comparative, you, you feel like um, Monti, he's the, the real utopian, right? So, I mean, Italy doesn't have the institutional legacies. It doesn't have the political coalitions to do that. It cannot work, right? And it's, it's a similar narrative you see in, in France, essentially, by saying, you know, they did that, it worked, and th this is why um, it would work in, in our case as well. And you, you, you address that and say it can't work. But my, my question was then, how is the research and development? So in a way, it's like we don't want the bad things from Germany, right, which is liberalization, but we want the nice things, which is research, development, human capital formation. But I wonder to what extent this is politically more viable um, than, than other strategies. My, my second point is on, um, on the uh, electoral politics of this. So in the... the, the there's no, not a chapter that deals with this kind of electoral politics in particular, but the conclusion talks about, um, especially about the Beramendi et al saying that, well, I wasn't actually really sure whether you consider that a rival explanation or a complementary explanation. Because on the one hand, you say, okay, it's a bit of a quiet politics area, research and development, and that's why this kind of noisy politics that characterizes electoral politics is not really, um, is not really the right focus to understand why research and development is, um, hasn't been pursued so much. But my, my reading of it is that the electoral story is very much complementary to what you were telling, in the sense that um, what I take from Beramendi et al is that the dominant social group is the petty bourgeoisie, um, invested in low value added sectors, and they don't have demand for research and development. Therefore, so I was, my, I guess my suggestion is to, to um, keep an eye on both things, on the, on the noisy electoral politics on the one hand, and what you already have, the, the um, quiet politics uh, producer group arena. So my, my final point is then, so if, I don't know, if, if we start from the assumption that, that the Monti utopia doesn't work uh, because Italy is not Germany and why should it become like this? And if research and development if there is not really demand among people, so to speak, and if the state capacity is not there to facilitate that kind of agenda, I was wondering whether we should not think, at least maybe this is a more an Italian statement, but think about existing comparative advantages and facilitate those comparative advantages, which could be in, in the arena of, of, say, tourism or intermediate goods, things that are there and facilitate them um, further in order to um, reinforce these comparative advantages. And I'm, my hunch is that, well, it, it, perhaps the, the, the response to that would be to say, economically, it's not good enough, right? So we've tried and it didn't work so well, but my hunch is that it's politically at least viable and therefore a more likely solution, if you want, than um, the more kind of Germanic, um, export-led CME style um, strategy. But I, I leave that for discussion, it's my hunch. Thank you very much.
All right, thank you to Philip and Paolo. So I would say that uh, you have a, a few minutes each if you want to respond. Um, I wouldn't keep longer than 10 minutes overall. So, um, and hopefully you have the same responses so to, the, to the comments so you don't have to repeat yourself. Um, uh, so uh, who wants to start or maybe just one? I don't know how you organize that. Luigi or Marino or Emanuele, who wants to respond? Whoever it is needs to unmute are you, himself. Are you okay. Going to, to start or are you trying to? Yeah, we can he we can I hear guess. you. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, Marino is starting. I can start. Very awesome. Briefly. Uh, extremely now, also because I may have to leave the. Uh, the conference uh, before uh, the end, so uh, I, I will start. Um, thanks a lot to, to well to the organization and thanks a lot to, to the two discussants. Uh, they were uh, really very very sharp uh, uh, comments, and uh, my I could uh, 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 stop my. Uh, answer in two minutes just by saying that I almost totally agree with what they were saying. <laughs> uh, no, really, it's not... Uh, uh, okay, let's start with Paolo Marquez. Um, the, uh, we have uh, put uh, uh, too uh, much emphasis uh, on the... Uh, there has been a, an excessive emphasis uh, uh, in low investment in education, uh, research and development, innovation policies, and so on. Uh, whereas, uh, and more, more generally, uh, in um, uh, supply side uh, uh, policies, incidentally, we always thought of uh, uh, supply side policies and uh, the, uh, the welfare policies, the uh, labor market policies, uh, the traditional uh, ones of the European social model. Uh, whereas uh, uh, for innovation policies, we uh, uh, tend not to think of them as a, as a supply side politics, but that's just a question of, uh, uh, of definition. Um, certainly, we have uh, put uh, very much emphasis on that, uh, I think for two main reasons. One, I must admit, um, although the book is on four countries, uh, the uh, um, the, the, the knowledge uh, of the people that uh, that contributed to the book uh, was uh, was much more knowledgeable about Italy, especially the three of us and, and several others, and Spain, than on Portugal and uh, and Greece, and that's a limit which obviously uh, appears here and there in the. Uh, uh, we, we try to uh, to deal with the four countries in each uh, uh, chapter, but uh, also due to the different uh, amount of literature of existing literature, certainly uh, there is more emphasis uh, on uh, Italy and Spain than on Portugal and uh, and Greece. And uh, what uh, Paolo was saying about, uh, for instance, Portugal uh, having uh, invested a lot uh, on. Uh, uh, educa on tertiary education, uh, on, uh, 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 on research and development, uh, and that this uh, showed up uh, in, uh, for instance, in the PISA results, uh, in uh, the dropping of early levers and so on, uh, is certainly true for uh, Portugal and partly is much less true for, uh, for Spain and uh, unfortunately very, very less true for Italy. So. Uh, uh, having emphasized more on the on the two, uh, having having taken into account more the two largest countries, uh, this uh, this uh, 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 emphasis uh, did did not seem to us uh, excessive. But there is a second reason. Uh, the second reason is uh, again here we have to refer especially to Italy, also partly to the other three countries. Uh, if we look at the last 30 years, uh, we see that the, 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 these countries, especially Italy again, uh, have had a very, very low level of productivity. And uh, the very, very low level of productivity, uh, we cannot explain uh, uh, other than uh, by having uh, 
uh, a relatively uh, low skilled uh, percentage of uh, labor force, uh, a relatively uh, a, a, a segment of the of the economy which is uh, not uh, very highly technology intensive and so on. Uh, and that is, uh, uh, I mean, it's undoubtedly true. Uh, um, what uh, uh, it is so true that uh, the, the the recent uh, next EU generation, uh, which uh, in Italy translated into the P, uh, Piano Nazionale di, uh, uh, di Resilienza e Ripresa, Ripresa e Resilienza, uh, put an emphasis on it, uh, put the emphasis on the, on the, on the need to uh, uh, change, uh, to try to change the economic structure by shifting it from uh, a low productivity, uh, a, highly, a high percentage of low productivity uh, ec economy uh, sectors to a higher um, level of uh, uh, high productivity economic sectors. Um, however, Paolo says, uh, despite investments uh, the si in Portugal, the size of knowledge intensive sectors did not expand and this shows that uh, it's not enough uh, to uh, uh, work only on the supply side, that, but, the, but that you need uh, on the demand side, so to speak, uh, you need uh, an industrial policy uh, and, uh, and uh, the lack of, of an industrial policy with a strong state intervention uh, it, it, it is what would be needed, uh, but uh, it goes against uh, the European Union competition policy. So, okay, I absolutely agree with this. I think that this is an extremely good point. Although I'm not so sure that uh, uh, European Union competition policies cannot be, in a sense, uh, circumvented. Uh, the French, uh, the French uh, uh, do that a lot of time. I mean, and the French uh, uh, do have uh, an industrial policy and a strong state intervention. We have seen uh, even now the uh, acquisition of uh, ADF by the French state, uh, a, a strong state intervention, and uh, the, EU, uh, the European Union competition policies can be uh, only a partial uh, uh, shield against it. Um, Marino, you uh, have only a couple of minutes so yeah, left, okay, no, no, either okay, for you I, or for I, anyone else among the I, authors you I, decide. I stop, I okay. <laughs> uh, well, the second uh, uh, the comment uh, was uh, absolutely uh, interesting uh, uh, as well. Uh, the two questions, uh, is a solution uh, with more research and development uh, uh, politically viable? Well, I, mean, I, I think that uh, what, uh, f uh, from, the type, uh, from the time of Monti that he was referring to, to now, there has been that the, the, uh, the EU next generation plan has put an emphasis uh, or has led Italian actors to put an emphasis uh, on uh, improving uh, Productivity, and in order to improve productivity, you need a shift towards uh, higher research and development, uh, uh, better human capital, and so on. And electoral politics, certainly, electoral politics, uh, uh, sh we should uh, give uh, more uh, uh, emphasis on that. Uh, so, looking more at the demand side, not only on the supply side, and looking more at the electoral policies are two suggestion that I think are extremely important. Thanks a lot for the, uh, for the comments. Thank you, uh, Marino. <clears throat> and Emanuele, okay, you, you, uh, you're welcome to jump in. I'm determined to leave at least half an hour for discussion, so uh, literally like uh, two minutes, and then uh, we'll, we'll open to the floor. The floor. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Apologies again for not being there. I would have loved it. Um, I, can't, I mean, I'm glad just a couple of points, uh, and I thank again uh, the two discussants. I agree with most of their points. I just pick on two of them or three of them. Um, one is, as it was stressed uh, in the first, uh, by the first uh, uh, reviewer of our, of our book, um, 
we see an increasingly increasingly a, di a difference between the Iberian countries and Greece and Italy on the other side. So some of the data is showed us show a common trend for Southern Europe, but at the same time, for instance, the OECD PISA results from Portugal has gone quite better than what you would have found in Greece and Italy, for instance. So still what I meant is an increasing diversification in the future uh, among the four countries with this two and two plus two splits. Uh, industrial policy, absolutely. I, I, and during while we were writing the book, at the end of the book, my clear idea shared by Marina and Luigi is that we need to study a lot more and get into the picture industrial policies. Uh, I totally agree with you. Uh, the problem with industrial policies at the same time is that you know if they've been successful only after several years. There is a whole huge literature, especially by economists on there, saying it's kind of hard to get the right industrial policy when especially you want to boost innovation. It's clear at a theoretical level it's quite more complicated to get the right one in terms of picking sectors, picking companies, and so on. Um, just to make it very short on Philippe, yeah, Philippe also as well got uh, got the point. Uh, what, is, what about the future? What are the comparative advantages? Uh, should we stress more on tourism and certain type of manufacturing instead of trying to follow the German way and we wouldn't perhaps institutionally be able to do that? Um, I agree that that is the core question. At the same time, though, at least for Italy and partially Spain, what I think we need to understand is they missed the knowledge economy turn in the last 15 years. If you look at Italian and partially Spanish economic structure in the middle of the 90s, it was still quite competitive and closer to what we had in continental Europe. What happened is that in the last 20, 25 years, Central North and Italy, part of Spain, went to a separate way compared to what the Germans and the Austrians and others in continental Europe have done. So it's not that they've always been like that because their institutions didn't allow them to be competitive on like medium quality manufacturing and export. Uh, they started to perform in this respect quite worse than what they used to do. So whereas other countries try to move forward to the high road uh, through different ways. So, of course, the Scandinavians are not the same as the Germans or the Austrians or, or other countries. What really seems to have happened is that in the last 20 years, uh, Southern Europe was not able to upgrade its strategy that had worked previously, again, at least for Italy and partially Spain. So it's, it's a lot more contingent in a way what happened in the last 20 years, and that's why I think there is still kind of also room uh, for, for changes. As, as Luigi was saying at the beginning, a lot of mistakes or not correct decisions uh, have been taken in the last 20 years, which sent to a separate way part of Southern Europe compared to where it used to be previously in the 90s and the 80s. I hope I've been short enough that was awesome, Emanuele. I really appreciate that you uh, that you managed to be here despite everything. Um, all right. Uh, so I would say uh, that maybe we open the floor to uh, discussion, and um, maybe the best way to do it would be that you come here and you ask your questions, so that we don't have to turn the camera all the time. We try to have a discussion, um, but if you are uncomfortable with that, you can also tell me the question, and I will. I will, um, I will repeat it in the mic. Um, so, okay, and also if you introduce yourself as well, so that we get to know each other. Okay, I have already three questions, uh, so get ready. Uh, I think we'll collect a few, and then I will let you respond. Hey there, so I'm Nicolas, I'm Brazilian, but I'm doing my PhD in Italy, in the Escola Normale Superiore. And like I have one quick question, and it's related to one thing, like a kind of bias. I didn't read the book, but I, th I feel a bias in the whole conversation that all of the models that are being exposed are sport-led models. Even when you're talking about um, fiscal policy, it's for industrial policies that are oriented for exporting later. 
And the problem for me in this is that you, you forget about like the real economics on the ground for people. And I think like at least three other options could be included here. And one would be fiscal policy for health, for example, health services. Like this, like it's a demand input and then like it improves life uh, immediately. Or residential credit that would boost domestic economies. And the, the third one, which for me is the most important one, is like where is wage-led growth? Where is like pushing higher wages for increasing uh, life, uh, quality of life immediately? and boosting demand and domestic economies. And this is like the, uh, the quick question. <laughs> Great, I think we have Doro and also, sorry, yeah, and another one, yeah. So we'll have four questions and then I'll let you respond. Hi, so I'm very happy to see you on screen, even if I um, cannot see you in person. I was hoping to see you in person. So I have, it's a, Sorry, I'm Dor Doro Bole, um, University of Vienna. Um, so I have, I mean, it follows a little bit up on what uh, my previous, uh, uh, sp this previous speaker asked. So I wonder, your whole story is a little bit the story of the post-financial crisis and Germany seemingly coming out as the big winner. Now, if we look at what's happening now, this model is just crushing, right, as we speak. Nobody should go in any way following any continental European growth model anymore. It's reliant on outsourcing, on cheap uh, immigrant labor on, on all sectors and on, uh, on cheap um, relocation of resources. And it's relying on global value chains, which are just breaking down. And it's relying on Russian gas and oil, which we don't get anymore. So I wonder, in light of this, what are your thoughts on how to imagine in the current situation a viable survival model rather than growth model, right? And on which resources would that rely? And I think here the, the issue of health, uh, for instance, care work or whatever might be just one, but uh, I mean, there's so many more. But I would really want to turn this debate away from, you know, what seemingly was successful, which it wasn't, we see, and uh, what, what we are going to face. And this is not only uh, the, the Mediterranean countries, but they might even have some distinctive, distinctive advantages in this. Uh, so I would be interested in your thoughts. Thanks. Okay, thank you so much. My name is Dario Guarascio, Sapienza University of Rome. Hi, Emanuele. <laughs> And thanks to the authors for this interesting presentation. What I would say links a little bit to what has been just said. I would think that something that could be beneficial is introducing elements related to structural interdependencies and hierarchies within the European productive structures. Because this helps us to frame the uh, crisis of Southern Europe also as a story of core periphery divergence and of interdependencies. And in this respect, we would find why there has been some kind of lock-in situation according to which uh, you have explanations on why R&D uh, expenditures have been not so high and you have uh, observed a let's say a structural weakening of the industrial structure in the South which made quite uh, inevitable the development that we have witnessed. But now I really uh, agree on what has been just said, that if we have been uh, drawn here by a growth model which was mostly the German export-led growth model, now this is basically uh, no longer working in the current context. And so industrial policies and ways to reimagine the development of southern European countries uh, is uh, uh, truly an issue uh, that, for example, in the, and, and across the, the uh, next generation EU in South Europe as the National Recovery and Resilience Plan is still not up to the task. I mean, if you look at how industrial policy or non-industrial policies are declined within those plans. So we should hope for some kind of really new issues in policies in this respect. Yeah. Hello, hello. Uh, thank you for the presentations. I think it's a very interesting book. I will, I'm looking forward to, to, to read it. 
I think it's very important to continue the discussion about um, models of capitalism and uh, answering the critiques that have been uh, out there for a while. One of the critiques has also been the topic of um, methodological nationalism, which um, ignores the, the regional differences that are, can be very strong. And of course, um, I've been, in the, in, the, in the case of Italy, one remembers the, the long discussion about the Mezzogiorno problem and uh, the strong differences between North and South, and which is a similar thing in, in, in Spain. So my, my question here would be like, is this something that uh, you, you've been uh, considering in your studies and how to adapt, adjust to these, to these uh, differences? And maybe one short uh, second point, second uh, question would be like, um, I think it's, it's important to overcome this, um, the, the black and white thinking about the strategy of export-led uh, or, or um, uh, 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 knowledge, knowledge-based trajectories of of upgrading. Um, don't you think that we 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 will need uh, diversify a lot more um, these these the pathways of um, building building growth models, growth regimes in a different way? So you were Bruno Gandelgruber okay. so from uh, Guam in Mexico. One more question, and then I, I promise. I hope you took notes. Okay. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much. My name is Michael Schädlich from Goethe University. I have uh, just an anal analytical question. Uh, Paolo and um, others also mentioned that uh, there are similarities um, of uh, countries from Southern Europe to countries from the Global South. And next week, I'm invited to a workshop at the Max Planck Institute, which is about peripheral capitalism. And several contributions are um, about Ireland and um, Italy and Spain, for instance. And so this is uh, my question to you in how far makes it sense to compare Italy and Spain to countries like Brazil, uh, Mexico, and Turkey. Um, does it make sense um, at all? Yeah, this would be my question. Thank you. Awesome. OK. Uh, lots of questions, uh, and I'm sure there will be others. So I will, uh, I will leave some space for a second round, also because I, I need to abuse my role as a chair to give some comments as well. Uh, I would say, like, uh, uh, five minutes, uh, seven minutes to respond to the questions, uh, even a bit more. Who wants to start? I may start. Yeah, is. Awesome. Thank you for your questions and also thank you again for uh, the suggestions for further developments by discussion. And very, very, <laughs> very huge questions to reply in two minutes. So it's very, very difficult to, and also, because when we finished the book, it was 2020, the, the end of 2020, so, uh, or many of the challenges that we are now facing were not present at the moment. So, we, but, but the general questions that some of you um, did uh, about what kind uh, of uh, response that can be now to the current challenges and how this book may contribute to understand what kind of, of response we may have uh, is particularly important. And in terms of what kind of responses, and I mean, it's very difficult to, to know the path, but I think that there, are, there is something in the book that is important. One, some basic and constitutive institutional feature of these four countries are particularly important in order to understand how they face crisis in general. And it may be crisis, financial crisis in 2008, it may be the social economic impact of the COVID, uh, or it may be um, the, the impact of the actual situation with the problem of energy, etc. One of them, one of these constitutive, I, I only want to make an example. One of these constitutive features is the role, is the um, policy capacity of public administration. And this is also related to, to something that I already mentioned, the, to discuss, and particularly Philip, about the viability of this model. I think that it is not 
simply a matter on how we invest in certain direction or what kind of policies in terms of the amount of funds that you are dedicating to them for education or for other response, uh, but also in, in terms of quality of public intervention. And this is particularly true in all the crises we are facing as Southern European countries. So it is true for the, facing the financial crisis. I think it's true also for facing the, the uh, pandemic, socioeconomic crisis, and it is also true now. For example, if you take the, the, the case of the, that Marino mentioned, and some of you mentioned uh, the National Plan for Recovery, that is the massive, a very massive amount of investments, at least for the Italian case. The problem, is, I think, is not simply how much we spend in certain direction, but also on the public capacity to implement in a very effective way this huge amount of money we are going to spend in many different institutional arenas. And this is true for all the policies that we are um, trying to do. So, in, 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 so this is true for the case of the reaction to the 2008 crisis, the financial crisis, but it is also true now for the case of trying to uh, face with the energy problem. And then another very brief so it is, it is very, so in order to answer to Doro and to Ada, it is very difficult to know and to have a, a, an answer to your questions, but I think that there are some basic institutional reforms that we could do, and the functioning of the public administration is, is a particular, it is an, one example of the very important areas in, in which we could invest with having some results, some positive results in, in, in terms of quality of policy making. The second thing that I want to say is about methodological nationalism, that is, <laughs> is a very important uh, suggestion and critics to the book, because many of us, and especially me, and also, but also Marino, we, I did a lot of work on regional dimensions, so for me, the, the I, I usually am one of the of the people who is um, saying this kind of critics to other books, for example. So, they, what about the regional dimensions? What, what is interesting is that many of the weaknesses that we are emphasizing at the national level are, in a certain sense, replicated at local level. So, if you try to explain the difference, if you take the Italian case from the northern part of Italy that is functioning quite well, also in this difficult situation, and the southern part of Italy that is working quite badly, um, not only in this specific situation, you see that specific kind of policies play a very important role. And again, policies for research and development, policies for education, etc. That is, it is true that in Italy, Portugal, Spain, the amount of money expended in this kind of policies is rising, as Paulo said during his presentation, but in comparative perspectives, the level is very low. But if you take into account the regions in which, in, in the, all of these four countries in which you have a higher growth, you see that the, re, the regional expenditure in the science, in this, in this uh, part of uh, policy in this part of in this institutional arena are higher. So I, I will stop here and leave other questions to the other two. Thank you, Luigi. And uh, and if Marino Marino or Emanuele, do you want to address any other uh, question? Uh, if yeah. Marino does uh, no, like no, to no, no, thanks. Okay. Just a couple of things. I jump on what Luigi just said. Um, and also to, to the last question in terms of comparing Brazil, for instance, with Spain and Italy and so on. Well, the key point, as Luigi said, is, which I'm afraid uh, countries like in Latin America share with Southern Europe to different extents, is exactly the capacity of public administration to perform. And it's not just a general issue, it's also about the room of maneuver um, the public sector and, and governments have. So for instance, it's not a case that in Southern Europe, in, in welfare, but also in industrial policies, you have a lot of transfers instead of services, or you've got fiscal incentives instead, instead of services. Because if you want to deliver good quality services, you need to have a good quality public administration. 
So in the very moment you have a weak public administration, it means that the tools you can use to try to steer the economy or to support the economy are reduced, is reduced the room of maneuver. Um, and we will need to do more research on that, looking also how, how it can be feasible to improve it. Um, the other point, which is, I know a nuclear bomb just dropped at quarter to noon, is about what the last, um, I think, was Bruno saying, uh, should we go beyond export-led versus uh, demand-led uh, dichotomies in explaining? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's something that I think, think comes up also in our book. Uh, I think all the, all the recent literature in the last 10 years about growth models is great. Chiara, with others that we were quoting before, Lucho has written very interesting things on that. Uh, uh, at the same time, I think uh, we need to get also more nuance on that. If you look at it from the uh, company's perspective, I don't think companies would reason in terms of should I try to grow exporting or should I try to grow selling to the internal market. Usually they adopt mixed strategies. So I think uh, we should get more the analysis in terms of strategies and also uh, growth strategies, uh, export versus demand-led, of course, but also to integrate more with what Luigi was saying, of how countries try to develop kind of territorial growth, which is not too uh, dualized, as in the case of Italy and also in the case of Spain, for instance. Um, look at more uh, industrial sectors and how they work. Um, so I think we should try to start from this kind of dichotomy uh, and then improve it and add other dimensions there in order to understand what is going on and what could be feasible in terms of new, new paths of, of growth for the future. Thank you a lot, Emanuele. I think we already have some, some questions ready. Uh, so Akira wants to ask a question, uh, Sonia and myself. <laughs> Great. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Kira Garzukatsuyani. I'm at the European Institute of the LSE. Thank you very much for a really, really interesting conversation. I think also these last comments on this paradox between needing a very activist industrial policy in settings with very low public sector capacity is a very important kind of puzzle to, to discuss in this context. And I don't think you can talk about the one without talking about the other. Um, I wanted to push a little bit further on this issue of the distributive implications of the strategy that is proposed on the sub-national level. So my, I think the, the, the strategy that has been highlighted based on R&D and you know, high, high skills, et cetera, is rather a strategy for, for cities, right? So it relies on agglomeration. It's not a, a strategy that is there for kind of many rural areas. It's there for a few cities, even even, even if they're spread among a few regions. So I was wondering, what about the rest of the country? So what kind of, you know, what kind of you know, growth model or whatever you want to call it can we envisage for the rest of the country? And especially in Italy, you have these pockets of very high, high road of development based on SMEs. Is that a model that can also help us address this question of more spatially balanced um, development? Thanks. Hi, Sonia Avliash, Marie Curie Fellow at University of Belgrade. I know Luigi, I know Emanuele, okay, so hi. Uh, so uh, my question concerns the, the idea that growth models are like taking place in advanced democracies. And then if we talk, if you look at the Europeanization literature, the advice is that like there needs to be a lot more democratization in order to achieve a certain level of growth. Then if we look at Central and Eastern Europe, we actually see that the model like, has had like institutional hollowing, democratic backsliding. And then we hear in the context of the Southern European uh, countries when Paolo said that the reason why the Southern European countries cannot imitate the uh, Central and Eastern Europe is because of the democratic factors and the impossibility from like, the social perspective. So I was wondering, how do you, in your book, theorize the dynamics between democracy and these growth models, if there is like a, yeah, if there is a, if there's that in the book or not, because I have not had a chance yet to read it. Thanks. Right. Um, right. I have uh, a question. 
or a point that relates a little bit to the comment that Nicolau made uh, right at the beginning and picks on the productivity point made uh, by, um, by Marino. And it's about like how we understand industrial policy, or at least what I think uh, you mean by industrial policy, given also the comments of Paolo and Philip. So uh, I, if I think about, uh, if I think about Italy, so I think it, innovation policies are important and human capital is important for manufacturing. So I think actually differently from Philip that it, Italy has a comparative advantage in manufacturing in the industrial district. Actually, high-end manufacturing uh, has actually kept up quite well uh, compared to the other three countries. It's also uh, that moved to low end and, uh, and, and uh, medium um, services. Uh, so innovation policies there can actually help increase the real productivity. This is how it works in manufacturing. So human capital, technology, etc. But the other, uh, the other sector uh, which is really dominant, if we take a gross model perspective in Italy, and here I agree with Philip, is uh, hospitality and tourism and and uh, and in those sectors you cannot right actually you cannot raise real productivity because uh, i mean you can invest in human capital only that bit you can invest in innovation only that bit but there is not much you can do it just uh, doesn't work so there's a really like demand side policies in terms of um increasing purchasing power so that uh, so that uh, uh, restaurants and shops can actually raise their prices and therefore nominal productivity. So it would be really, really important. So I was wondering whether uh, uh, whether you thought about differentiating, maybe in, a, in the second book, differentiating industrial policy uh, uh, depending on the sector and depending on the supply versus demand side that would also lead to a more balanced growth models that I think we are all sort of hinting at. Maybe only expert-led model is not the right one. Uh, all right, so that was the third question. Does anyone uh, want to add anything? Otherwise, I'll let. I like this feminine ending so, to this. So I, I do appreciate that. So I'll let, uh, I'll let the authors uh, respond. I leave it to you because I, I, I had some problems with the microphone. I could I can hear uh, for two minutes and then I cannot hear for a couple of minutes. I'm very sorry. So I leave it to. Okay, I will start and then Manuel, if you want to continue. I, I want very very briefly about the the questions of the, of, of the first question about the role of um, the territorial scale of industrial policies in the sense. That was um, that, that, that industrial policies on research and development on innovation favor cities. Um, this is only, I mean, I, I partially agree, only partially because in may, in some of these countries, especially Spain and also Italy, the kind of uh, um, manufacturing that Chiara mentioned in the, at, the big, at the end of this is industrial districts and so on and so forth are not located in cities, are quite dispersed among a high net, a high, uh, um, a, a, between a fabric of small and medium cities. So there is not this process of polarization. In Italy, for example, for this was polarized in very large cities, but smart manufacturing is quite widespread in the territory at the regional level. What is, but I agree with you that, there, that this kind of policies may, may have the impact of reinforcing a cleavage between very strong regions and very weak regions, and especially between regions of the north, and for example, taking the Italian case of the northern part of Italy, especially Lombardy, Piedmont, Veneto, and Emilia Romagna, and many regions of the south. This is because these four regions, have, and this is a similar process also in the other three, the other three southern Europe countries, um, uh, because these regions has a very uh, higher capacity, uh, absorptive capacity of public policies in the flow of innovation. So if you do a lot of innovation, a lot of policies in order to reinforce the research and development, probably you may, without making development policies for weak regions, you, you, you have the risk to increase the cleavage, the territorial cleavage at the regional level, not at the level of cities, but at the regional level. And this is a very huge problem, naturally, in the in southern European countries. 
And uh, very briefly about industrial policies, Chiara, you are perfectly right. Um, industrial policies is a very huge and also I will answer to Paolo at the beginning, is a, is a very huge field of policy. It's very, very huge. And we decided to pick a very small but important part of industrial policies related to innovation, innovation policies. But this is only a small part of industrial policies, and we are perfectly aware of this. And this is this part of industrial policies that are addressed to uh, reinforce the, 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 the strengths of manufacturing firms. But it is also true that, so I agree with Chiara, I agree with your suggestions to adopt this broader approach to industrial policy story also in order to understand what has been done or not for sectors like tourism and so on and so forth. But it is true that it is also true that innovation policies play also um, a very important role in tourism, for example, in, in, in reinforcing the quality of uh, tourism that you are going to, to favor. I'm living in Florence, so I, I am very well aware of the impact of tourism. But again, also in this case, you may have the high road and the low road of tourism. And probably the high road is a bit connected with the connection between traditional industrial policies for tourism and more innovative industrial policies for tourism based on, based on innovation, for the valorization, for example. Of the of the cultural environments and so on and so forth. So I, I agree with you, but at the same time, also policies for innovation may play a role in more traditional, very traditional sector like tourism in order to improve their quality and the quality of the employment of these of these uh, sectors. And I stop here, Emmanuel. I don't know if you want to. Oh um, yeah, I just add up and I reframe what we decided. I don't have too much to add, uh, but one point. I think as, as a community of scholars doing comparative political economy, we need to understand better, uh, increasingly better in the future, how different countries manage to coordinate different, I mean, different territories, regions, and economic growth models in regions. So how at the central state level, you're able to take Italy, for example, to create some sort of a virtuous model of growth where you put together the industrial north and the, hopefully the demand touristic led uh, growth in the south. So we need to understand better how countries are successful in harmonizing different territorial growth, knowing that this is becoming the main source of economic and social inequality in the 21st century, so less among countries, more within countries. Um, and the other point is exactly how, it goes to Chiara's question, how can you have a model with industrial policies that at the same time are good for high-tech companies um, exporting or whatever, and for tourism? And as we just say, probably we need a, a more nuanced analysis also on both sectors and how uh, policy, industrial policies can be applied to it. Uh, but I think we need at least for Southern Europe, more research on how this works or it doesn't work um, actually in, in current policies. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, to all the authors. And I hope, uh, Marino, you managed to hear some of, uh, of the comments and responses as well. I'm so glad that we managed to organize uh, this uh, nevertheless. <laughs> And thanks to Roberta especially for providing the, this Zoom link that works so well through the University of Milano. Um, so thank you all. Thank you especially to the discussant, Paolo and, and Philly, for their amazing, amazing job. And I hope to see you around in one of the other sessions of the network. Thanks. Enjoy the